so just so everybody knows. So question is, is there any benefit to periodizing your training, going like hypertrophy, strength, power, or some other uh, order of that? So that would be a conjugate style of periodization, meaning you're, dis you're discreetly training for specific variables versus a concurrent training model where you're training everything at the same time. Don't confuse concurrent periodization with, or sorry, uh, conjugate periodization with conjugate training, which is West side. That's different. So the fun fact is Louis Simmons started calling this conjugate training when it's really concurrent because they train everything at the same time. In any event, my answer to you is no, don't do that. Here's why. One, they're not, they're not Olympic weightlifters, right? So spending a ton of time on the Olympic lifts not, not and, and only that, it's probably, probably not useful. Your job as their strength and conditioning coach is to get them strong, and to the degree that you can improve the conditioning they need for their sport-specific tasks, that's your job, right? So does doing power clean <coughs> get somebody strong? No. It's a sub-maximal display of strength, right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean they don't need to do them a little bit, right? If not, they're not a whole block if, of them, if that's, yeah. their, if that's the question. Correct. Yeah. Further, if they're not very good at them, then it's not very useful for their training. They'd be more, they'd be better by getting their deadlifts up, right? So I think that you already have scant training resources, and so the idea of uh, uh, de uh, dedicating those scant training resources to just hypertrophy, <coughs> just power, uh, I probably wouldn't. That being said, in my programming lecture, we just talked about the very uh, how important hypertrophy was, right? Mm -hmm. So a really well-programmed strength block should have significant hypertrophy work as well, or otherwise contribute significantly to hypertrophy, meaning has enough volume to do so. And so if it's me, I would rather do concurrent training, where you're training everything at once. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of different training models that'll do that. DUP does that on a weekly basis. They have like a hypertrophy day, a power day, a strength day. I don't think that's the best way to program either, but that's, you could do that. You're kind of, so are you the head strength conditioning coach? No, I'm still undergrad. You're still undergrad. But, I mean, going through the courses. Um, yeah, that's NSCA 101, but they, they just, that, that's what, straight from the book. Yeah. You're going to have to regurgitate that on the test. Uh, I'm taking assessment of strength conditioning. Yeah. It's, and that's, that's what they're the essentials of strength conditioning. Yeah. But in my mind, I was like, why, why would I do that? <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. So good. You passed the first test. <laughs>
compared to the other inputs that you have on performance. Right. Unless you freaked out about it well, affecting your performance the next week. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess, I guess what I'm what I'm saying is that there are other things I'd expect to affect how you do more than that. Right. Yeah. And, and so, if I mean, if this was like a, if you had to squat 405 for a double for a million dollars, and then it's happened to fall all the day after that you had that thing, then I'd be like, hey, can we just move the test back like a little bit? So, yeah. so we just one less variable to mess with, but for your normal training, yeah. Okay, and you guys said too, like there's not like an optimal amount of sleep that you can define as. Certainly not on an in, like to give an individual recommendation on a population level. The current guidelines say somewhere between seven and eight hours. Do you but do you think the eight? Do you think the eight is in there? Is this a holdover? Probably. Like so, seven is the number. It's like seven point two something was the average number of hours where people had the lowest mortality and morbidity yeah. of disease. All right. So when they're writing this up, here's how I imagine this goes. They're like, hey, we gotta write this up. We probably can't just say 7.2, it's not, it's not sticky enough. You go, yeah, just put seven to eight. Well, yeah, there's also the consideration of what are the error bars around the 7.2. Well, yeah, okay, but you, sure. th you think it was but, point, point 0.8 hours? No, but here's the, other, here's the other thing to think about, is that that data is for morbidity mortality, right? After everything you've heard us present this weekend, particularly discussing numerous situations where there appears to be a spectrum, right, of individual differences on things, right? How can we tell you your optimal amount of sleep is X? There's no way. There's no way. It's impossible. Yeah. Right? So you might, turns out, you perform best when you have 7.6 hours of sleep, X percent of which is REM sleep, when you have no apneic events overnight and things like that, right? We can't tell you that. And then he next to you might be 7.8 or something like that. So just do the best you can. Yeah. Right. right? And I wouldn't sweat your, I mean, your little weekend swings in sleep schedule too much. Okay. Especially if there's something you can do about it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's going to be published and up to date. It'll probably be out this summer. Yes. Yes. Yep. It will be directly accessible to any primary care physician who has access to up to date. Which should be every, yeah. almost every. Private practice might not have a subscription to it, but yeah. you know. How do you think they live? <laughs> they what just, do they do? They just practice on whatever they learned back in med school and do like, a lot of things wrong. <laughs> is it, I'll edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> so the way, we, the way we structured the article is the introduction discusses kind of general concepts and strength training. Uh, the middle section discusses strength training, the evidence for strength training in very specific medical conditions, kind of going down various bodily systems and medical problems that are very common, like heart failure and heart and, and coronary heart disease and stroke and diabetes, obesity, things like that, chronic kidney disease, whatever medical conditions we see most commonly. And then there was a practical section of like putting it together and, con and uh, risks, you know, concerns over musculoskeletal injuries or whatever, addressing addressing the concerns that physicians might have when it comes to actually recommending this stuff. So that's the that's the structure. When we wrote it, it ended up being what, over ten thousand words, the first draft or something like that. Yeah, so it was monster. long. So there uh, the ultimate plan is to actually divide it into two separate articles that are gonna be more digestible. Um, and so that I would expect to be out sometime this summer. Well, so that's the thing is you have to define an outcome. If you just want something that's like impressive or that's like a compelling study when it comes to resistance training for any outcome, I mean, there's lots of those. And, and if you wanted to pick and choose one, you can just go through the article once it's published and we cited a bunch of them. If you want a very specific example that's relatable to what you all did this weekend, in 2017, there was a trial called the LIFTMOR trial. Yeah, L-I-F-T-M-O-R trial. It's, you know, all these trials now have acronyms. L-I-F-T-M-O-R. M-O-R, yeah. Yeah. And, they, and they, they took a bunch of uh, like 65 year old women with osteoporosis and had them squat five sets of five, press five sets of five, and deadlift, <laughs> and progressively so, overloaded them over the course of the so study. With barbells. With barbells. Perfect. Correct. Right, yes. Perfect. If you wanted a very, very direct example relating to what we did, um, I don't believe they showed any signs of uh, volume sensitivity. <laughs> Well, they're volume trial. resistant. And then their bone low. density improved. There you go. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. <laughs> you're probably volume resistant if you're old. Yes. Which means you need more what? Yes. 
Stress. Need more stress. Less won't work. Less won't work. Less won't work. <laughs>
It's good for muscle hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. It's good for resensitizing you to the main lifts, right? Uh, and additionally, uh, I mean, I've done the restoration blocks. I view it as a washout, a washout period. Like you've had this previous huge, like consistent training stress yep. that you went through, and then you have a washout period. It's two weeks, three weeks tops, and then back to it. So, but from an injury prevention standpoint, I think that would require a discussion of, all right, where do we draw the line between like what's pain? It's not the same as injury. Injury is not the same as pain. Okay, and does resistance training respond? <clears throat> Uh, a, a, a variability in resistance training in and of itself produce decreased injury rates in resistance training. And you're like, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that either. I do know the injury rate within resistance training itself is extremely low. So, yeah, competitive weightlifting the same. So, I probably wouldn't do anything based on injury management in resistance training. And I think if you put a gun to Mike's head, you know, he's like, you don't really have evidence for and then, that sort of a claim. Yeah. And then, and then he would he would say it's most mostly for a, a resensitization. That's I mean that's what he's told me. So. In, so they do a few things. One, they would increase muscle cross-sectional area. It could be good for hypertrophy. Why? Because you can do a lot of volume that's not terribly stressful. Right? It's more volume. It's some stress, but it's not like doing a bunch of barbell rows or deadlifts, for instance. Right? So it's somewhere on that spectrum. It's unique. They're different. You haven't seen them before, so they're novel. So you don't have to do a lot of volume to get a ton of response from them. Uh, so good for muscle cross-sectional area, muscle hypertrophy. Are they great for strength? I think and so I think the only contribution is the hypertrophy. I don't think they're great for strength development when they're that far away from the actual movement that you're testing them. See what I'm saying? Right. I could make an argument, I could make a better argument for leg press on the squat, for instance, or leg press on the deadlift than I could GHR or lap pull down would be a, you know, that'd be a stretch in my opinion, outside yeah. of muscle hypertrophy. I think both of us probably, when we have folks who have just been training maybe into a high level meet, or something like that, and the, the initial few weeks afterwards, they definitely go to far less specific exercise selection, um, generally lower intensities, and uh, maybe the first week, most of them want a mental break. So I need a the, mental break, the man. Initial, initially, the, the training volume at that stage might be a little lower in that week afterwards, but, do, then it, but then it goes up again with these different exercises for a little while before we get back into dedicated training. So yeah, I, I would agree that there's probably not an injury prevention deal there. Uh, there is everything that he said in terms of the novel stress and there's also uh, whatever goes on up here in terms of you know when you have been training for weeks and months on end to prepare for a given meet doing the competition lifts especially towards the end that when that's almost all you're doing uh, sometimes you want to break and you want to do something totally different so I might take a conventional puller and have a pull sumo for a couple weeks afterwards. Or no you so wouldn't. Just did it. No you week. wouldn't. Done it. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah. Next thing you tell you tell me sometimes you have people squat high bar. Frequently. Whoa! <laughs> Who are yeah. you? Yeah. I don't even know you. Yeah. So <laughs> it's my CNS fried. Unlikely. Fried CNS? <laughs> it's that, undercooked. I mean it's undercooked. You're not fried, you're undercooked. <laughs> I like that. That's the next that's the next t shirt. <laughs> this is your brain under trained. Yeah. Yeah, well, so it depends on a person. So if they're a novice, then you could probably actually get stronger. If they're well, post-novice... So like with college athletes. Well, they still may be novices if they've never really trained before. But if they're post-novices <coughs> and they're in season in a sport that has a hyper-focused season where they have a lot of practice and games and everything else like that, and they can only train twice a week, they're not getting stronger then. And they're probably actually going to detrain. I mean, they... There's no way. There's no way they can. The Correct, because you're still you're still providing something to stave off the decay. There's just nothing you can really do. But the more, the more trained they are from a strength standpoint, the harder it's going to be to maintain that over the course of the sport season. Yeah. Yeah. That being said, they may still perform better. I mean, you know, yeah. at that being trained at a high level. <clears throat> yeah. The main thing would be to try to maintain as many useful characteristics as you can, right? And don't do a lot of extra non-productive stress. That's a great question. So your question was about what kind of certifications would they have? Or or experience or training, like, you know, and I know it's a lot of the certificates are kind of not worth the paper they're printed on, but so you would probably be designing one. 
Yeah. yeah. That's a big process. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. So I, I think that they would have some uh, probably graduate level degree, mainly because that means that their critical thinking skills are high, right? I don't, probably in a science related field because it'd be very difficult to say, okay, you have no science background and now you're going to interpret all this data that you're, it'd be difficult to do. Uh, after that, I do not think that there's a credential right now that's worth having that would show me that someone knows how to coach or program this stuff. So I'd rather, instead of that, that they have practical experience doing this. So that they've been a lifter for a while and they've been coaching people for a while, even if they've been doing it wrong, right? So at least then they've had spent some time under the bar and they kind of have some, you know, those intangibles that, that you can't pay for, you know, it's just a time related thing. So graduate level, some graduate level science related field would be fine. They would have experience and then they would have free time to learn. I, I mean, look, you and I both went to medical school, all right? I have a graduate degree, a uh, master's degree uh, on, on, top, on top of that. We've both been training for a long period of time. Like, this is the most inefficient way to go about becoming uh, a, a useful strength coach and still we're losing to Jim Wendler. <laughs> who couldn't articulate any of this. We're losing to Mark Bell, all right? Who, it would be an evisceration if we got to debate these people, all right? But we're losing to them. So let me, let me change my answer. If I wanted to be the most effective strength coach, it would be a female, all right, who's very, very attractive and who's a mute and has, <laughs> and has a lot of money to pay for the PR agent, the professional <laughs> photos, the plastic surgery that's gonna long, uh, elongate her career, right? And who also has really low morals. That would be the best strength coach from a financial incentive. Yeah, I don't think he's gonna be able to make that yeah. <laughs> Just looking at him real quick. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so, I don't know, it's just, you know, honestly, it's just frustrating being in this industry, because I, I feel like, I, I talk to these people all, these, all the time, and I'm like, how are you in this position, right? So on the one hand, I'm pumped that they're trying to get other people to train, right? If that's goal number one, cool, we're all in this together. I'm happy that you're spreading the word. But then when it comes down to the nitty-gritty, how are you coaching people? How are you programming people? What are you advocating for? And you're full of shit. You're full of shit. And the best case scenario is you're putting that out yourself. You're writing that stuff down and publishing it yourself. The worst case scenario is someone's having that bullshit ghostwritten for them. Right? So it's put in, being put out even more places. And it's like, no one didn't pick up your trash ebook. You didn't even write it, but it's still trash. <laughs> right? We're losing to those people. We're losing to those people. And uh, based on numbers, we're trying to do a little better. So, anyway, if I had to build the best strength coach, they'd have a graduate degree in science related field. They would have trained themselves and trained others. And if I had to recommend a credential, I think I'd still have to say the starting strength credential sure. at this time. It's a great place to start. Get an Instagram account today. <laughs>
Um, but if I had to do it, I've, I've done it before when I had to do it. My, I mean, my preference was something similar some way, but I would do a banana instead of oats because that felt that it just healthier. went down a little easier and healthier, <laughs> healthier. What? Well, I didn't you, want to feel all that paleo. fiber sitting in my stomach for a little while. Sure, paleo. So, just yeah, that's what we mean, like some sort of a carb like that that you can tolerate well while you train. Yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't eat anything during training. That's my rule of thumb is generally not eat anything during. So right as soon as you roll out of bed, you have that. Maybe you change clothes. Feel like you have a BM coming on. Do that. <laughs> then you're ready to go. Or maybe make sure you have a BM before your first set. Of well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 Well, you know you're sometimes ready to it has to mobilize a little bit, you know, and then you start warming up, and then right before your first work set, take care of it. Yeah. You take your knee sleeves off when you go to the bathroom. No. <laughs> you leave them all. Yeah. Uh, really? I pull them down. <laughs> Individual variation. I don't. I like. I feel like. I feel like I'm getting. You know. They're like cutting. You know. In. Nah. All right. It's fine. All right. <laughs>
at everything and have no strength background and then go to the games. It's never happened, never will happen. You have a bunch of super freak athletes that have been identified and they say, hey, I wanna make some money and I can't play my regular sport anymore, I'm gonna go do CrossFit. That's what happens. Okay, so that's, that's, that's one of the negative things. The supplement industry that is associated with CrossFit is the worst part of the supplement industry. I didn't think that it could get worse than the bodybuilding part, but it did. CrossFit, CrossFit existed. Cross, CrossFit started. So that's, that's fun uh, to deal with. The amount of nocebo and snake oil salespeople within the CrossFit community is unrivaled in other athletic disciplines. You got a Complex, you've got Ramwa, you've got literally Smashworks, and you mean Rock Tape, you go down the list, literally all that stuff is bullshit. Bullshit. And they're taking people's money under the guise that if you don't do this, you can't compete. Here's the newsflash, you can't compete anyway. <laughs> you can't. If you did, you would have already known it. You would have been selected for it. Okay? So I think that's fraudulent in a way. But then I have to assume that these people are smart and that they know and then they're not. So I don't know. That's tough, tough to actually say it's wrong. Okay. Greg Glassman has lost his mind. I assume. You know. But he did give grand rounds at uh, UVA. Mm -hmm. So the medical community is not immune from the uh, from getting bit by the CrossFit bug. Um, other positive things about CrossFit. <laughs> <laughs> There's a gym in nearly every city that I've ever wanted to go to to do a camp in and I can now yeah. do camp there. CrossFit folks are some of the hardest working folks that I've ever met. They're some of the nicest folks I've ever met. And I have nothing bad to say about my experience with CrossFit other than the programming and the people who are in charge of running mm -hmm. CrossFit. So I'm pro CrossFit as long as you don't actually do CrossFit or work for CrossFit. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I say one more thing about CrossFit? I don't care. Okay, cool. <laughs> What is CrossFit? Well, you, come on. You well, know. what is I it? I mean, yeah, it's right. Don't tell me the broad time, modal domain, mix, mix it. Don't, don't, what is CrossFit? What, or more specifically, what is not CrossFit? Well, I mean, I, I think it would just be like a strength movement with like a, like a lot. So if there's no Metcon, right. it's not CrossFit. That's where we draw the line. Where do we draw the line? I mean, I would say it would have it in it, yeah. Okay, but if there's no Metcon, it's, it's not CrossFit. Didn't they do like a softball throw? Well, well, I mean, yeah. they probably do, but that wouldn't be, most people wouldn't say. That this is t stereotypically CrossFit. Right. Yeah, typically CrossFit. So I think, yeah, so I think if you agree that the main site <coughs> is representative of CrossFit, what it really is, then it's a terrible strength program, it's terrible for hypertrophy, it's not great for getting good at CrossFit, Okay, because you don't have enough repeated exposure to specific skills, right? Specific strength <laughs> movements to get better at those, right? Just because something's scalable doesn't mean it's still effective, all right? So I think that the best thing about CrossFit has going for it is momentum. And they've got all these people doing it, but nobody's saying, hey, what do we do it? <laughs>